All right, we are back and hopefully everything got connected correctly. So if we don't have audio, please let us know in the chat. I think we have audio though. These according to my audio meters. All right, so we will do another pause of our open design issues on GitHub and zoom out a little bit so we actually have a chance of seeing more than two items at once. Any references for order? Otherwise, I would just sort them all as to news and then we can just yeah, most comments. Let's start with the most controversial first, so we make sure we don't get anything is, done today. Is this running? Is that what we're doing? Um, all right, bound a concurrent queue. Let's finish this. I, I've seen this too many times. Uh, I mean, that one was locked on Steve. Yeah, Steve is back now, so. Well, we have to wait for him to actually join the call. That is I join. I still don't see it, but I can I can you know psychically envision what you're looking at. <laughs> All right, bounded concurrent queue. Okay. Yeah, it seems like you picked up a neat, a neat set of skills while you were on leave. It did. Very very useful. I would totally take that. All right, so let me just scroll down to the last time I commented on this because if I can find my mouse again. Where Last time we remembered that we were blocked on Steve. Yeah, but what were we blocked on? I don't know. So you you had asked whether it could be combined into a single type and into the existing concurrent queue, right. and I shared what that looked like, including a, a commit that would show the implementation, and then I commented on various as part of that various APIs currently on a concurrent queue that would when you constructed it kind of with a bound, uh, that would not work. Right. And you asked, uh, why wouldn't some of them work? Uh, and I further explained. So what would you prefer us doing then? Um, I personally don't have a strong preference. I would like to expose the functionality. I think it's valuable. There are already a few places in core effects, at least I think at least two, where we're taking advantage of the code being there, and we just sort of include that the type uh, as you know as internal, uh, right. so that we can use it directly. I don't have a strong preference with how it's exposed, whether it's part of the existing type or whether it's a standalone. A few of the people that have commented seem to prefer the standalone uh, because. Um, uh, they think that whether certain APIs function or not based on a new constructor parameter uh, seems flawed. I'm fine with that. I don't, I don't feel the same way, but uh, I'm okay with that. Um, so I think we, if, if people agree we want the functionality, we just need to decide whether we want it as a, basically a new constructor and you know, a few methods and then some methods on the type not working when that constructor is used or as a new type. Um, right. So give and us some details, like what methods would not work? So if you scroll up to my comment on July 6th, um, uh, it's, I don't know if you guys have IM, but it's this comment that I just posted, um, or just pasted into the IM. Yeah, we have it, but I can't click on it from my computer, unfortunately. So I have to, what is it, July 6th, you said? It's not. That's sixty percent of the way down the page. Yeah, we see it. Right uh, here we go. It's yeah, I'm actually seeing it right here. So bounded capacity. Well, those are. Oh, so that just bounded capacity would not. No, I think it's new. Oh no, I think we're looking for a different comment on July six. No, this is the ones at the bottom, right? Oh, there we go. Okay, so. Right. So we already have triad, correct? Correct. And what does it? When does it return false today? It never returns false today. It's part of the interface. It's it's mm. part of an interface where some other implementations of the interface will return false, but this implementation of the interface, because concurrent queue is unbounded, it will always return true. It'll end queue and return true. But with this new bound thing. If you reach the bound, obviously, then triad won't have anywhere to put it and would return false. Oh, so in queue would just spin. Hmm. It would either have to spin or throw. 
um, either spin until space is available or throw if we decide that we want that to be the semantic. Yeah. And then try two array copy to two array would throw invalid operation exception. Why? Um, <clears throat> so this is what I explained uh, in my long comment below, but I'll summarize. So the way this is implemented to be very efficient, um, concurrent queue is itself made up of, is basically a linked list of circular queues, mm -hmm. circular arrays. Um, and uh, when you um, end queue and uh, one of this and the segment is full, uh, we then create a new segment. Um, but if it's not full, we just you know, end queue into the current segment. So as long as there's room in the current segment, um, and which is circular, uh, we just keep reusing the current segment. Um, now, there are certain operations, however, that uh, aren't just take something out and put something in. Some of them are look at something that's currently in the queue, uh, like peak, uh, for example, or to array, which needs to copy the data. And there are some significant race conditions and corruption possibilities if we were to allow looking at the data while it was also uh, also being removed, basically. And so how we deal with that is um, if you perform any operation on concurrent queue that causes us to need to look at the data but not remove it, we basically mark that segment as no longer being valid for end queues. Because what could happen is, let's say, uh, let's say the queue is, let's say the segment is full, um, and uh, then someone dequeues, so there's, let's say, you know, one space left, and then someone says, I want to look at the data in the segment, and so it, uh, uh, it well, I'm not, this, basically, if we, if because it's circular, we could end up kind of going around the end, the end of the segment and overriding something while it's currently being looked at, in which case you end up with torn data. Um, and so we deal with that by saying the moment you look at something in the segment without removing it, we just prevent future NQs into that segment. We create a whole new segment, uh, and future, all future NQs go into that new segment. And then, you know, the current one is drained by DQs, and eventually it's garbage collected. And if you, you know, then look at the stuff in the new segment, well, we create yet another segment and so on. And this all just works because Concurrent queue is already unbounded, and so it supports any number of segments. But if we go with the approach of just having this bounded capacity that's based on the fact that right. you just construct concurrent queue with a single segment, you can never add additional segments. Well, but would the bound mean how many items are in the queue or how many slots we have in the queue? Because if the bound means how many items, we could still do it. I understand why we cannot say you know, it's the, the bounded capacity is for the slots. So the, the, this is gets down to implementation detail and we a choice. Right now, the implementation is incredibly efficient because the t answers to your two questions are both yes, one and the same. The number of slots equals the number of items. And therefore, we don't have to do any additional interlocks. We don't have to do any additional checks. It's just, is there space available? If yes, then I'm under the bound. If no, then I'm at the bound. If you want to start um, introducing the idea that the number of that the bound could be different from the number of slots, then we need to track those separately, um, which A means there will be more cost for uh, the bounded tracking because we would need to do interlocked operations and the like. But I expect it would also mean there would be more cost even for the existing cases uh, because at the very least we need to check whether we are bounded or not and then decide which path to go down. Do we do those? Do we do that counting or not? So I have another question. So like, okay, if we if we were to go with a new type, right, bounded queue or something, how would that be different? Because then it could accept this inefficiency that we just talked about. Basically, I think that a new type could say, well, it's bounded, and it, it would pay a bit more cost for having a separate count for a number of items from, you know, <laughs> Two pieces to it. That's what Chris Bob said is just true. Sorry, is true. Um, however, that, that, um, if we made a certain choice, the other choices, which what I initially proposed, is um, basically we just expose the segment type with a different name. 
Um, and how is it different? Well, you don't have to worry about all the operations that would look at the data while they're still in the queue because we don't expose those APIs. We simply don't expose to array, copy to, get enumerator, anything that would let you look yes, at the data. These are, such a, that you could... yeah, these are operations that like people expect to have on, on the queue. Well, couldn't you have the bounded queue and then have an explicit like freeze data operation, which would allow you to do copy and enumeration? But then you need to have frozen. checks in every single member. Am I frozen? Yeah, but that's yeah. likely cheaper than the cost of checking length versus count, etc. So you mean if like you you would have a freeze and an unfreeze? Basically, I mean that's what we do in like WPF for all of the data types where we have to have concurrent if, access across if, threads, but then you need to freeze it when it's actually being like read by the UI right. thread. So, so you're saying that you would basically switch it back and forth between a concurrent mode and a non-concurrent mode? Basically, and if so if you're operating, if you're doing anything that doesn't require enumeration, it can just be in concurrent mode. But if you have to enumerate for any reason or you want to use link on it, et cetera, then you would have to freeze it to do that. But well, the there's, there's, the state for the most part, there's, no, re there's no reason you would even need those methods. If you agreed that these methods were never used when it was being operated on concurrently, then you could certainly implement them. You wouldn't actually have to switch its mode. You just have to agree that there are no race conditions because no one's racing. Sure, but how would you do that to the, I mean, so basically you would not throw, is that what you're saying? You just said be careful? I mean, doesn't the debugger I'm, use I'm these saying, methods? I'm saying, that, I'm saying that if you have the methods, the methods would effectively be no ops because you, you, you couldn't guarantee, well, how do I say this? Um, you expose the methods, but in order to use the methods safely, you couldn't be using the collection concurrently. Therefore, the methods themselves don't really have value. The well, only thing they could possibly do would be to sort of set a flag, and then if you did not hit the race condition and we happened to do, you know, and we checked the flag, some of the time we would be able to tell you you were doing it wrong, but there are race conditions, so we wouldn't always be able to tell you. Right. Yeah, I think, like, in practice, though, what ends up happening with these methods is that you're sending in the debugger, so nothing's happening right now. I just want to inspect what the current set is, right? And then that's where two arrays is, like, super useful, right? or just enumerable in general is super useful if you just want to inspect what the current state is. Sure, if you have other threads still running and they're still in queue while you're sitting in the debugger, you might have other I, problems. I think we have to, like, if these methods don't work, I wouldn't even call it concurrent queue because there's such a, I mean, bounded concurrent queue because the, it would be such a strong expectation. It would create such a strong expectation that, like, it's just like the concurrent queue except it's bounded. So I think, I think we have, there's a sliding scale here. I think we have a choice to make. One, one valid choice would be close this issue, don't do anything. Uh, we continue doing what we're doing internally and people can do whatever they want externally. Another would be, well, we expose the type and we care more about API surface area than we do about utmost in performance. I don't know what the trade-off would be. Let's say, you know, 80% of the performance and all the APIs we care about. And if we do that, we expose a new type we can do whatever we want to make a thread safe, and we don't get the best perf, but we get decent perf, and we expose all these APIs. So by the way, coincidentally or not, I was actually looking yesterday, um, ML.NET has a type called object queue, and they actually use concurrent queue as an implementation. Yeah. And uh, I actually noticed that they have a problem, uh, that it's unbounded, so if you keep, um, you know, putting returning objects to the queue, it just grows indefinitely. It kind of grows indefinitely. It, it will never be collected and whatnot. And I was kind of looking at the code and I was thinking it would be nice because for pools you kind of want to, you know, as long as I have hundred of those. Uh, and if somebody, you know, if there are zero objects in the pool, I create new one. If there are hundred, I kind of like garbage collect. If somebody in, in that to case, that every all the access is through object pool, so they could have some interlock counter and make their own decisions, can they? Uh, well, you sure. they kind of want to use they actually are using concurrent queue because it is actually I also measured some perf, and it's actually quite fast despite the fact that some people complain about concurrent queue. I kind of found it fast, and the implementation is very lean. 
uh, but it doesn't have this bound, which would be super useful for implementing. Well, my point was, if you're accessing it all from the same place like they are, then you can just have a counter. Yeah, they, they don't expose the concurrent queue, right? They're rapid. It's, it's, it's implementation detail of object pool, right? So, so you, nothing stops so this is where I was getting back to the, the comment about, you know, Chris Bob's comment about you can maintain a separate count from the number of slots. Right. Like, that adds cost. And that adds cost whether it's in the implementation or out of the implementation. So if you, you know, maybe maybe they don't need the unmost and perf and it wouldn't matter for them. Right. I'm just hesitant to put that into, like, bake that fundamentally into a, a type that we want to expose. But yeah. we could. Um, and it's just a question of how, you know, do, do we want uh, the flexibility of the API versus the best possible form? Do, do, do we have a rough read on the kind of cost? I mean, I've never seen interlock operations show up on the other hand. This is obviously highly sensitive place. Um, so right now, concurrent queue uh, entails effectively one interlocked operation, uh, uh, one interlocked per NQ or DQ. Um, uh, if you were to add another one, will it double the number? Okay. And when you talk about the sort of this low level, if you're really looking for throughput, interlocks are kind of the things that you start counting to look at sort of the rough cost of right. things. Yeah. Yeah, put it in perspective, a lock in .NET is effectively two, internet, two interlocked operations. I, I, I wonder, Dan, if, if our experience is also colored by the fact that we tend to look at x86 and x64. Like, uh, Steve, do you happen to know if interlocked operations are more expensive on ARM hardware given their different memory models? Yeah, basically figure everything on ARM is uh, volatile and interlocked on ARM are, are significantly more expensive. So there, than there's a good scenario where it would matter then. Also, it so depends on whether there's contention or not, correct? Right. Well, that's another thing. That's another one of the things that concurrent queue provides. So, uh, the if there's more than one item in the concurrent queue, then uh, n queuers and d queuers actually synchronize on different things. So the interlocked operations aren't on the same memory location; they're on two different locations. If you had your own count, if you if you were maintaining a count, you would basically all n queuers and all d queuers would have to interlock on that same location, so you get more contention. But the uh, interesting thing is, when I implement object pool and I want a bound, it doesn't have to be super precise. You know, like for object pools, I kind of want around 100 items in the queue, but I don't care right. whether it's 99 or 105. So that's another one of these one of these limitations. You know, the, one of the reasons this is able to, you know, to so let me take a step back. I, the, what I propose doing here is uh, a very, very, very constrained API based on limitations of the implementation. And one of those constraints is that the, the, so, the bound to capacity is limited to being a power of two, um, which is what lets us, uh, by, by having a, a power of two and have that be the number of slots based on the size of the array, uh, it allows very efficient indexing into the array because we don't have to do things like uh, mod operations. Uh, we can just, you know, knock off the top bits and get the index into the, uh, in the, into the array. Um, it's, and so, you know, if we want, um, there the, are the trade-offs. Like, you know, if we're okay with the capacity being a power of two, and as Christoph says, just sort of being approximately in the vicinity of the bound that you would want, um, then we can, uh, you know, in, encode that limitation into the implementation and get performance benefits. If instead we want to be able to support any bound and have that be exact, that's going to make the implementation be more expensive, and we would probably end up doing something like having a single count that we interlock, interlock to increment and decrement on. I would think that if we're going to expose this as a highly specialized perf-oriented concurrent queue, then we shouldn't have it under system collections concurrent, because people will expect most of the stuff under system collections to work with link, etc., because all the other types do today. I would think that maybe a new namespace that specifically says, like, this is a perp-oriented type, it does not provide full functionality, might be a better place for this, and potential other uh, collections that would operate in the same manner. Well, but that's the yeah, thing, right? Potentially... Specialized namespace. Yeah. System collections lean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, 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 we have... Well, obviously, I don't think we're going to come to a quick resolution on this. Uh, 
I think that what CoreFX wants is the hyperlean type, and that we probably don't want that as the public API. And if until we can decide if we want to make something lean or something generally usable, this is probably a non-actionable item. Okay, but I would say that, uh, and tell me if I'm wrong, we, we all agree that kind of we don't want a public type that is so butchered that it doesn't look like a concurrent view. Correct? Like it needs to have some like needs to be able you need to be able to enumerate it and to array copy could to need to work. Do we agree? No. I you you would that. ship a public type called bounded concurrent view that doesn't have I would it as long as it doesn't define those methods, I would yeah. I would be willing or I would think it would be reasonable to ship. I don't think it would be willing to that it would be reasonable to add a new type that has those methods and they just throw them. Oh yeah, I <laughs> yeah. Uh, if it I would doesn't say have the more, methods, I then it's, say, this is we could change the name of it if the Q name is what's bothering you. <laughs> if we want to make it more constrained, sure. That would be the current FIFO. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also, like if we just need it for our own, uh, you know, purposes, like being, you know, internal, then it's fine. We can call it whatever we want. But like, I think a public type that is called bounded concurrent Q needs to look like a concurrent Q. I would think at least that that's true if it's in the BCL. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But that's good though because it yeah. means people see the value on it. Right now we're just haggling over naming. Isn't that what we're doing all the time? Yeah. So I think we need scenarios to know what thing we want to ship and whether it's we make this thing look more like concurrent queue and make it public and then don't use it internally, or if we make a thing that looks like the internal one and we rename it because what people want is. So actually, what so prompted this scenario. this issue? Like. Ooh, ooh. Steve, you opened the proposal. What was yeah. what was the reason? Uh, because we're currently using this inter this type is uh, I, in the CoreFX code base. I separated this type out so it could be used on its own as internal, mm -hmm. and we're currently using it in one or two places as an object pool. Right. Oh, as an object pool as well. So, by the way, um, uh, we actually started to work on kind of, you know, maybe there are some types in ML.NET that we should deserialize. And one of the things that we, I, as I mentioned, I started to look into is the object pool. Um, so the work items seem to be related at least a bit. So then maybe we should wait until we actually have an object pool proposal and then we can look at this and say, what's the supporting type to make that? As an object good. pool, you wouldn't care about enumerating. Potentially not. Yeah. Yes. People might not care about ordering. Right. So even though you're thinking maybe bring this type in at the same time that the scenario comes online. Yeah, because because as Jeremy said, sure, right? And never you have like <laughs> contention between goal X or Y. Like you need to have some scenario to say like what would it do to my scenario, right? I mean you don't you basically what you want to avoid is this worst of all worlds outcome where people that care about prof don't use the type because it's too slow. And people that care about usability also don't use the type because it's actually not usable, and then you have a type of no customer. Right? And that's, we have done this a few times in the past, and that would be bad. So, in that case, let's do this. Let's just mark this as uh, needs work. And I will just record the fact that we will come back to it once we have an object for proposal so it doesn't show up every single it week. almost it, are there any other scenarios, Steve? Or basically, object pooling is the scenario for this new addition? Uh, there are other scenarios, they're just not as prominent. So, um, if you were, if you had a producer consumer situation and, uh, you know, you were handing off data from the producer to consumer and you were okay throwing away data if the producer got too far ahead of the consumer, um, you could use something like this, but there are other policies in such a situation that are viable as well. You could, for example, throttle the producer, or you might want to get rid of the newest instead of the oldest, or overwrite, or whatever. So it ends up being one policy in a producer-consumer scenario that may or may not be you know, viable. So to that particular point, SignalR actually has a very similar internal type as one of their core algorithms they might be able to remove that internal type and use something like this, which means that, you know, the, 
the type would obviously get more testing, like it would maybe be more specialized and so on. But is it used for object pooling in SignalR or no, for in, in a consumer producer? It's a consumer producer scenario. What they do is, because um, I, I, I know the scenario because I actually wrote this code for them, but uh, you have a producer writing data as quickly as it can to each consumer, and the consumer only cares about like the 200-ish most recent elements, right? Like we, we have a concept of being able to specify a capacity, like you said, but the capacity is just a suggestion and it could get fudged one way or the other um, if the internal type decides it's more efficient to do that. Um, but it, it, this sounds like you know an ideal use case for this type. So what are the consumers, producer scenarios where you can lose data and not care? In SignalR? Yeah. Uh, SignalR has a concept of things like a stock ticker scenario, stuff like that. Um, or uh, I I only care about like the the most recent fifty moves in the game that I'm playing stuff like that like it, it is a mode that SignalR can run in where you only care about fresh data not scale data. I mean, you, you can imagine lots of scenarios. I mean, even just what we're doing right now, video chat, right? You if if, you, if things get backed up, it's better to lose frames than to like buffer everything. Yeah. Yeah. Because you always want to be up to date. That's the most important thing. Since we're designing scenarios, that's definitely not an API review, so yeah. uh, that's for offline. Yeah. But it's a team we should contact, though, when thinking more about this time. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I was mainly asking because I was wondering, do we need bounded concurrent queue or we just have object pool? If there are interesting scenarios where you can, you know, you want a queue, you don't want object pool, yet you are okay with losing data, then maybe yeah. we need kind of both types. But let's talk with, with colors and this stuff. All right. More item of the list. We pushed this one back last time. Yeah, time. I was about to say, I remember this one. This one is a bit more involved. Yeah, and we pushed the next one. You know, I, I, you know, I still can't see the screen. Would you do me a favor when you switch to new issue, just tell me which one you're looking at? Yeah, so what, what I did is uh, go to um, go to the uh, issue tab, filter down to everything that is marked as ready for review, and just sort by oldest to newest. And then we just walk them top to bottom. Okay, thanks. So we're looking at the system numerics vectors one. Yeah, and we just said we pushed this off last time because it was too too involved. Okay. Um, and so I think same is true with the proposal for half. I think that's another one we should look into, but that's a bit more involved. Um, all right, here's one from Asan. The read only char similar to string. Read only span of char. I mean. So it's basically split. It is split. It's equivalent to string that's split for span of the char. And we haven't done this in the past because we have to allocate, right? I think this is, yeah. Why I think not, we. Why not just return an array? I mean, you're, you're allocating anyway on every return. So I think the reason is that if you return an array, well, array for which part? So because it's an array of arrays so that is being returned. It's, you're returning I read only list of read only memory of char. Why not just return an array of read only memory of char? I mean, you're, you're allocating so anyway. I have Good. a more general question here, and that is um, we've talked in the past, and I still think we should do some sort of split operation that's allocation free, right? Some sort yes. of enumeration yeah. of the results. And that would be what you were using if you were using spans and cared about. Yes. allocation and perf. Mm -hmm. You're not going to use this API if you care about allocation and perf. And if you don't care about allocation and perf, you could do span dot two string dot split. I completely agree. Okay. This is the API that Emo was talking about. It's <laughs> yeah. in the middle. Yeah. It's uh, less convenient to use than string dot split and not as performant as the one that we actually want. Yeah. Well, so the same array is more useful than I read any list, isn't it? Like you can change the elements in it. Yeah. Um, so is your suggestion then, uh, Steve, to have a custom enumerator type then? Yeah, I, would, I suggest we have, uh, I thought you, you had suggested something like this for the UTF-8 string as well, or maybe I'm misremembering, but yes. some sort of, some sort of uh, uh, non-I enumerator, but 
you know, move next current same yeah. before each end. Yeah. Uh, that returns read only spans. Um, so each so time you be completely next. allocation free then. So there, there, yeah. there are actually two interesting things about that. The first is uh, you might have to define a different enumerator type for each one of these methods, or at least you might have to define different enumerator types because maybe the enumerators behave differently under the covers. Um, and, and that's okay, right? That's just work on our end. Uh, the other thing that becomes a bit weird and is... those types are not exposed, right? Just expose I enumerable. No, you, you actually have to expose a type, because if you expose Sorry. it through I enumerable, then it becomes boxed. So Sorry, you're... Levi, why would you need a different type? If, if there were differences in behavior for the different overloads, why, wouldn't, why couldn't you just make the single enumerator uh, you know, switch based on a mode or something? You, you could. Um, the, the reason that I was at least avoiding that in my own prototype is I didn't want to have a lot of branching within the enumerator itself. Um, but maybe that doesn't matter in the end. So, uh, before we talk about implementation, there's actually, yeah. I wanted to run an idea. There actually, there's actually a different way to, completely different way to design it. I was thinking about one choice we have, we return the numerator. And whether we have one or many, and I mean, that's, you know, performance, maybe some performance optimizations we could do. Another one is to use the, uh, the pattern that we use in other span APIs, where you have to pass in a buffer. So basically it's a split method where you have to provide a span to put the segments into. A span of spans in this case? Well, it, well span of it could be span of something. It could be even span of indexes. tuple of ints. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like where basically, because the, the issue with enumerator is that it doesn't have random access. So you kind of, it's it's not as convenient as yeah. today. Split returns you an array and you have random access and you can kind of access the first element and the third one and then go back to the first one or second one. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the most equivalent API is one where we don't return an array, but we take in a buffer. And if you provide a buffer that is too small, we just give you the first you know, buffer that length. But how and often do you need random access? I mean, like pretty much all the times when I need a string split, yeah. if I didn't care about correctness, sure, I just index into the thing and just say, you better give me something that is three elements. So long. I but think for correct code, you need to do bounce mm -hmm. checking anywhere. And at, at that point, I would argue, just do a for loop. You have your four variables that hold the four pieces you care about, and then you just go from there. So the mo I don't know. It, it, uh, most of the time when I... Uh, was writing code that needed to sp where I needed to split something. I needed like a third and you know third and eighth item. It's so convenient to do it when you have a buffer, and it's so inconvenient when you have an enumerator. And especially that th these enumerators would have to be structs, so you cannot like lo use link. Like there are many things that you, you know can. they would. It's just but well, it, it will compile. That's the thing. Yeah, right? yeah, and compile but, people will wonder why their performance. But it, it, like, yeah, I mean, because it couldn't get boxed if it's going to hold the span. The only way that it could do that is if it cheats and turns the to a pointer and and. So but I mean, you have to small. offset. Like, in order to do this, what you suggest, right? You basically would have to have a try pattern where you have, you don't know the number of uh, yeah. items up. But I want a third and an eighth one, so I pass a buffer of eight, and. Uh, you know, the split splits up to the eighth item, and now I just access the third and the eighth one. So you'd be reading a CSV. So you basically just say, so, but in this case, you wouldn't ask for buffer. You would basically just say, if the buffer isn't large enough, too bad, just give me the as much as you have, which is different from most of our other APIs. It would just tell you false, then you have to pass well, a bigger well, that's buffer. Specifying the count, right? I mean, we have those APIs okay. that they return, you know, like they return how many they filled in and whether they are done or not, this could be the same. So like if I if I care about the third and the eighth one, I pass a buffer of size eight. And if I don't know what I care about, I pass some buffer and then the API tells me whether it had more. Would you do both or would you just do the one? So that's what I was thinking. I don't, I don't have a very strong opinion. It's just, I was, I actually prototyped in the past the enumerator solution and this one it's not, a, I don't have yet, as I said, slam dunk opinion on which one, but the enumerator was not, so, was very inconvenient in the scenarios that I had. Does the 
Does the GC under because I know with span it, we understand that the pointer is pointing to a managed object and that, that keeps it alive. If it goes into memory as a as a byte star, for example, we, we lose the object tracking, right? Yeah, I mean, so, so make an array of byte. Yeah. Sorry, okay. uh, we're, it's a string. So make an array of, of char. char. Yeah. Uh, you, you, the last reference to the array is now captured in a span. Mm -hmm. You call split. If we're returning a memory, you you can't. Well, you can have this, this, yeah, this idea. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was okay. Um, I was just well, this idea the, only works if he, if he first makes a copy. Right, because it's the, if yeah. we took yeah. the span yeah. you're, you're right, and you're turned right. it into a pointer, then now the GC says the object is yeah. on track and, right. and eats it. So. so okay, uh, but I would say unless so, there's there are some comments below here, I will send work. it back to Ason and say first, like we don't want the API in the middle. Is yeah. that the conclusion? Yes. We don't want the we we don't want an API that is not as performant as it gets because we already have one of those. Yeah. It's string that split. And but it, I I could imagine though that there is a scenario where like I have I just have a bunch of comma separated values and I just want to for each one of them. And like, that's fine. That's a different proposal, which is the split iterator. I'm using okay. Java's word for this instead sure. of .nets because we. For reasons previously discussed, it can't make it a real enumerator. Yeah. So we would just have the the thing that meets the enumerator pattern. Sure. That isn't I enumerable, and then sure you could for each other. But we're, we're not we're not rejecting that as an overload proposal, though. It sounds like. Right. We're okay, we're, we're saying okay. this proposal does not uh, is not approved. It needs too much structural work for us to talk through it, and it's punt it back to the author sure. and move on. Having said that. Like on paper, what you just said sounds completely reasonable. Yeah, there are scenarios where you just enumerate. I have to say, I have not run into a case where that would be enough for me. Maybe I just didn't write. Like, I think, I mean, I think that we just want the next word, though this gets weird because once semantics come in, but like uh, Alexa, right? Give me the next token. All it is is a token iterator. Just give me a token, chomp, 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 chomp. Uh, the problem is, the definition of a token changes once you pass like a less than or yeah uh, somebody <laughs> would have to write a tokenizer with yeah, the yeah. prototypes of such api because then you realize yes. oh shoot i need this i need yes. that if and you were, suddenly this if you were writing a working. language that had yeah. no contextual tokenization uh so you know you're writing markdown for the first time and then uh, <laughs> then you can do it uh then that would just be a give me the next word but word becomes very oh, split I, can't do yeah. word because Going into a uh, open square bracket is a different word than the square bracket, and yeah. Okay, I also, uh, reading from the issue, it seems like Asom just opened the issue, but the proposal was done by somebody else, correct? Yeah. By Joe, but for the environment. Yeah, I, I, my, I personally think that alloca low allocation would be the only really real good reason for this. Yeah. So. But whether that be a, an iterator or a fill my buffer or yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly uh, you can do it yourself. Uh, bring a buff, bring buffer. a buffer reader too is like might be something interesting. Because you hold your array of separators and you use the I believe we wrote the index yeah. of and then you split at that plus one and move on and like this is an easy user extension. Well, okay, it's not super easy to, for example, use vectorized operations, which you can yeah. probably use if you know if you implement it. If you gave Carefully. a single separator instead of an array of separators. No, well, you can do it with an array. Okay. In, in by you, M You can match both ways both. depending which which buffer yeah. is longer. Ah, he has a The one that you're splitting or the buffer of the, the things that you want to split. The computer on. just tries both things and tells you which one works. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Ben just mentioned that another way to do it would be like a callback, right? You would have a span action or something, right? Which you could do as well, and if you have a local function, you mark it static, so you don't allocate a closure that might be not entirely horrible either, depending on what state you need to access. But for the most part, you would probably need some state somewhere, so I'm not sure you can yeah, in practice always allocate. You know, it makes it so difficult to know whether my closure will allocate or not. Static here, local function static in front of it. I was just saying that if you do. 
open paren, close paren, arrow, foo, open paren, close paren, that doesn't allocate, but if you just write the word foo, that does. Yes. Because C sharp 2 language specification. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think then this one, I think we can say close, right? Because we definitely don't want those APIs. And then whatever other proposal there is, it will be a new proposal. But we don't close when we don't like the API, but no. we like the scenario. Because I think we like the scenario. We should solve this problem. It's a very common scenario. We just don't like the API. Uh, you're saying, that, okay, fair enough. You're Send saying, it back okay, to okay, fair enough, fair enough, like, fair enough. All right, then we mark it as API needs to work. Yeah, so it seems working if Asson wants to close it and open a, a that is proposal that's his to manage. That works for me. Did you hit post on your comments? I did. Okay. I clicked. I click, so if not, sure you then, waiting to hit close and then I really hope that GitHub didn't need my comment. No, it didn't. All right. So next one. Uh, expression support for ref and read-only ref types. I think this one we had a chat with the... So, yeah, I talked with um, Jared about this. So we don't really have a really thoughtful story about how we will deal with expression trees and the new language semantics. So he's basically saying, this is not an API problem. Right? We really have to think how this whole thing composes in any meaningful way, and they haven't touched this in a long time. And so I don't think we would do what they're suggesting here, because it wouldn't even work the way you want it to anyways. Um, the only way you could make these ones work is if you the, if basically you create these expressions by hand and you just use the code gen portion of it, right? Where you say compile to lambda at the very end, where you basically use it as a glorified way to do ref emit, which arguably is not you know bad, but then again, like these things are also designed to be mapped from source, so you would have to design that a bit more. So somebody Ari was working on the reflection for by ref types. Where did we like, like? Is the feature working? Uh, it was handed off to someone. I can get you the name because I think it's very related. Correct. Uh, Obviously, the, Potter, right? The yeah. by ref reflection is different than the the reflection on the load. The by ref reflection should have been done months ago. Yeah. And checked in, and finished, and so not like handed off. It's just been done. Okay. Or it got killed. Yeah, no, it certainly didn't get killed. Isn't it super related? Like, if you don't have reflection for by ref type, this feature is useless. Yeah, you cannot saying. dehydrate the by ref types on the other side. Right. I just the the uh, I think that the by ref work that Eddie was doing is is is, is okay. done completely, and because the only thing he was working on. Uh, was the reflection only loads. Yeah, but I, I still see them as, as different though, because from this you can still create delegates that take ref or ref read only as their parameters. Like this is separate from reflection. I see you saying you can you can you can create types that just use yeah. by ref types in signatures. They don't actually. Yeah, because I mean uh, th this is really just code in the end, right? Okay, maybe you're right. Yeah, I can I can have a. An expression that uses span in the signatures but doesn't actually create or modify the span. Yeah. Just takes but, Yeah, I, can, I, I guess. I, it sounded you know, like you were saying that if we took this, it's essentially putting a, a, a patch on a syncing chip that like somebody needs to go think about what the yeah. what we need to do to get the new language semantics in for this whole thing. Which yeah, when I talked like to Jared, he basically yeah, even thing. said, like, we shouldn't do it at all, period. And I'm like, well, we probably want to have a design to do it at all. And he's, he, he didn't seem to be believing that this is doable in general without breaking compat. Because, because here's the other problem, right? Every single time you add an expression tree node, the other question is what happens for people like EF, right? Because you need somebody else to actually accept those expression trees and do something meaningful with that, right? If you only target as ref image, sure, we can, you know, this is just a library feature, we can do that. But every single person that actually uses expression trees today, like, the other problem is that when the compiler turns your source code into an expression tree, they don't really have a spec for what tree you're getting back, right? So people have made, this, you know, assumptions around, oh, if you do this thing, the compiler will have an object cast in there somewhere, so I but now that I can cast this node to a cast node and then I access the inner expression and then every time they change these things, code breaks. So they're very afraid to change the expression trees at all because they know every time they did it, like the world came to an end. 
And so I think that if we add new nodes, it's the same problem. Now you have, you know, somebody has to, that writes the visitor has to handle that node now and now deal with that in some meaningful fashion. But does it mean the whole feature of expression trees is kind of um, very problematic? Yeah, I mean, when like it's... Uh, new language features we cannot evolve expressions. Well, it's, it's like adding a value to an enum, right? Technically it's legal, but you're probably going to break every caller because or every consumer because they're not going to know what to do with it. Well, if they if they're likely to do a switch, if they only yeah. pass it around, then it's fine. But that's the form of expression trees, right? You expect the consumer to walk over it, right? yeah. so like, hey, and that is the fundamental problem. I think on .NET Framework, I think it's basically a non-starter because it's an in-place update. You break the world potentially, but it, well, I guess in that case, not because you would. No, just adding new place, expression yeah. is just when one producer of the tree yes. suddenly starts producing that's something true. that the consumer cannot consume. Yeah. But. I, th I think you basically just said that, you know, work with people like EF to make sure that when we add new nodes that there's a meaningful consumption story. The other thing we talked about was the whole idea that the compiler can lower things, right? And you can you can determine, like, how, how far do you want this thing to be? Do you want the actual syntax or do you want the lowered thing? Because you, you don't care about this, right? And they don't have a story for that either. So there's a bunch of stuff that needs to be thought out, and I think this one is not in the shape to do that. Yeah, so I, I, it sounds like... Wow. Somebody needs to own, you know, system link expressions, and they need to understand what the future of it's supposed to be before we start taking any other. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say I kind of don't like the uh, the pos Jared's position that you described. I see it as a bit of a cop out. It's like we have a feature, there are problems with it, and we're not gonna work on it. We're gonna just not evolve it. I mean, that seems... <laughs> it's yeah. a solution to the problem. I right? like what Je Jeremy said, which is, we need to have an owner that looks at uh, this holistically, not just like, hey, let's just slap this one exp right. you know, additional expression and move to on. To be fair, I, I was overly like yeah. communicating yeah. his point, but he basically said, let's start with no, and then let's find the scenarios that are broken and then think about how we would fix them, right? Because it's not a slam dunk to just add new things to it, right? Which I think is yeah. a is a fair. And then if the answer is some sort of the code gen won't ever produce these things, but we add APIs so that you can make the trees manually, then if that's what the owner of the feature decides, then right. Then we can evaluate that. But right now we're in a middle state and uh, let's keep let's keep getting rid of things that are in a middle oh, state. Oh god. What do they do? Collapse the So who's the owner? Who do we I believe so. Jared owns it. <laughs> this team owns it. Yeah. So we actually, yeah. You do. Yeah. No, I, I, I like what is <laughs> the main scenario for expression trees? What is it? Yeah? Is that what you say? Is EF yeah, the main scenario? Emo? Sorry, for what part? For expression trees. Well, there's, I think there's two primary scenarios. One of them is the, I just use it as a way to do ref emit. So I construct nodes by hand and I just call ref emit at the end. And the other scenario is you write code in C sharp and then rely on the compiler and enter an expression tree. You use that for link, iCareerable, and other things, right? So it's EF. This, the and other and one the is last one is EF. basically like any OR map or EF. Some of the MVVM frameworks do the same thing in order to access things from the view model. Um, yeah, to drive the design. All right. Yeah. One time feature has we have talked about this multiple times. This, this property returns true. I think it's something that I at some point had a list of things we need to go over. I believe it's in that list. Let me check, but I believe it is. Okay. Yes. Is runtime feature the thing that doesn't do what anyone thinks it does because it's really a compiler feature? That's right. It's okay. a compiler feature it's a compiler to discover runtime features. Compiler feature uses it to, yeah, to discover runtime features. Statically, I compile them. You guys were all there when we read the API, <laughs> so it's not my only fault. <laughs> just pointing that out. No, I, th I think so. The name makes sense, but it's just it's it's basically static discoverability of which features a runtime you target will definitely have, right? So which of our runtimes doesn't have a J? Is there another? That I oh, So that what? Xamarin iOS comes to mind. 
And then maybe isjid is not enough because they're working on IL interpretation. So if you do things above optimization, you might want to know whether your IL will be interpreted or whether it's actually going to be executed. So yes, you can ref emit. However, it's not an actual JIT running it, right? So there's a, yeah. So I think we need to have the API. I just don't know where to put it. I don't think it should be here. I know that for a fact. I think Jan had a comment just below there about location. About did you not add comment about this? Because this is connected to the next version of the standard too. Because we were talking about having light up feature for ref in particular. Yes, that's the thing we need to design actually. Um, but theoretically, as Emo said, ref emit could be functional but not jitted, or we could be in a yeah. So we may we only like where we have a jit, but we don't have ref emit if that's a state we could be in. Because like device guard maybe couldn't create new thing. I don't know. And then if we're in device guard, can we JIT even? Uh, yes, you can. Okay. What is device guard? Is that the... It's the Windows... The store? Make things be happy if you wrote your stuff in C and make things be a lot of question marks if you wrote them in C sharp. It basically, every every executable page needs to be signed so that you can't run any, uh, any unauthorized code on the machine. So, but I, I think even with it, it has JIT, I think it's a little too general. I think we could tie it to expression tree compile or other places or lightweight code generation. If we wanted to determine if it's interpreted or not, it should be on next to the feature as opposed to because each feature can still be independently done. And in general, like right, so, I, I was looking at the comment and it says it lists the runtimes that this feature is intended for, and the only one that we really is a product is Zamarin. Um, yeah, I, I think it would be super useful to understand, like, how would we use it in Zamari? Because I don't. Yeah, because I think most people are wanting this for, like, can I dynamically generate code? Yeah, yeah. so that's to be asked on and, the API you want to call. Yeah, and they yeah. don't care if it's interpreted or jitted. They just care that they can dynamically create code and then run it. Yeah. yeah. Right. So then that would be refimit, do you work, and then refimit, do you jit? As a separate question, yeah, yeah, and I, I understand they also like in you know Corarty is uh, Corarty and .NET Native are listed as well, and I understand that they want to move, for example, Corarty possibly forward, but it would be like we've had this problem in the past. We added some APIs for stuff that hasn't yet shipped or was not on track to ship, and then by the time we first added the API, right. then the platform was about to ship and they discovered that there's a problem with the API. Like, for example, this is not the right question that we want to ask. There's another question that we want to answer, and now we have an API that nobody uses. Yeah. AKA instant legacy. Yeah, instant legacy. It's not, not good. Yes, I think this one just needs design. I think that's. I think we need to get together at some point and just talk so, about it out in the meeting, and then. So needs work. Um, I believe that's probably. A well, good this way. one is even different because needs work is we understood what the API is and we don't like it, so let's redo it. This one is like, I don't have enough background. Like, well, I mean, like it's basically more for than the feature to team. It just happens kind of that. Talk with us. I think like it needs work is just okay. The scenario is valid, right? I don't even know that. For this one, maybe you guys know. I don't. No, I'm pretty confident that this is not. Is supported? <laughs> yeah. Like so I, I can, I can envision environments where JIT is not supported, but I just don't know of any. Well, uh, uh, iOS. Windows Store application. No, maybe? iOS. You cannot JIT on iOS. Period. By policy yeah, of my yeah. Okay, so store applications and Windows, iOS, everything else. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, but as we said, so I understand that. I was just more like, is this the question that you? Well, so, so, so I, okay, I think that goes back to the API, right? I would I would say there's a scenario where you need to detect somehow whether cogen is supported, and the question is how would you do that? What APIs are affected? What capability question do you want to ask? And that's the part that needs work. More I think the general scenario is, I think, valid. More mm. importantly, you need to be able to do no. something if the answer is no. No, no. Yeah. JIT is different than, so, JIT is different than uh, code generation. JIT is very implicit. And I would want to understand why compiler would care. 
No, it's not for the because compiler. Because as we talk. No, no, it's not for the compiler. Like, okay. it's basically, th think of this way, right? So we are about to add Refinbit to .NET Standard. It's mm. on the proposal for 2.1. Well, it will throw performance support on iOS. So you need to be able to say up front, will this throw or can I call this API? Because I don't want it yeah, to Yeah, that's like, different catch. than JIT. Because I, so as we observe, that. it could be doing interpretation. Yeah. So okay. you do you use Refinbit, and it basically gives you a blob, and then you call the blob, and it does uh, you know interpretation, and it doesn't do any JIT. Exactly. So that's what that's what I'm saying. I think the, to this work that I just linked is exactly talking about these two things. Like there's the does it work period, and then well it works, but is that what you wanted? Because if you use Refinbit for performance optimization, you probably don't want the interpreted version of that because it's probably not fast enough. Like take regex, right? It, like regex, the only reason why you compile to IL is for perf. Like actually interpreting the regex is probably faster than interpreting the IL that represents the regex. And so like as the owner, you know, right? And then you have to make the decision whether you want to do that. The question is, do we have an API that answers that? And today the answer is no, you don't. You just call the API and pray, right? And I think that's what I'm saying. I think the scenario is valid. It's just where does the API go and what kind of question does it allow you to answer, right? Yeah. I think has JIT is not the right one. Um, That's what I was saying. Yeah. I'm not even convinced that this question is what people want to ask. And with like even tiered JIT, like what does it mean? It does interpret initially. Well, maybe. I don't know what yeah. that Which is why I said I think the actual question here is can I dynamically generate executable code? Because it, it doesn't matter, most people don't care if it's interpreted or if it's jitted or if they're literally creating a function pointer emitting raw assembly bytes and then calling into that. Exactly. They just care, can I generate code dynamically and then execute it? Yes, that is probably also fair. All right, so we talked this to death. Vector of T should have a constructor that accepts read only span of T. Is that one of those things? No, I don't think that was one of mine. No, it was not. Levi, you followed, you better know what this is about. <laughs> uh, there was a, um, basically, I, I was running into problems where um, I had a read-only span of byte, for instance, and I was trying to get a vector of byte from it, and I kept falling back to memory marshal. And I'm like, I, this can't be our answer to the, to the moment. That's all. Is it would there be great if I could slice and then just make this. Is there a reason why we added the vector of t from span rather than just adding from read-only span? Uh, that is a mistake on my part. It's presumably you would want both. Or no, no, no. I meant you, you said the vector currently has a vector constructor that takes a span of t. Yeah. I'm wondering. If we did oh, that. oh, yeah. Because um, because if if I'm reading data, for instance, like I say that I want to vectorize a, a string operation or vectorize a search or something like that, it would be great if I could slice and then uh, and that data is coming into me as a read-only span. I think the question is why does it have a writable or why did it take writable span? I'm saying why did we add the existing yeah. one to begin with? Why didn't we just add one that took a read-only span? Because uh, if I you want know. to modify, okay, because I think, isn't, does it, does it, it even, does it effectively create a copy? Does it create copy or not? Yes, it does because it stores it in a register. Ooh. Right, so why do we do span rather than read-only span? <laughs> It, it may have just been oversight during the initial API review, I don't know. But I thought, so you can reinterpret cast using memory marshal. Yes. And that it doesn't create a copy. It does. So it it depends on, it depends on whether your vector, sorry, if you have a ref vector, then it will, the register will point to memory, which is no copy. If you have a regular vector instead of a ref vector, then everything is going to end up in the XMM or YMM register, which is a copy. Is, okay, you can create so many vectors. You can create many vectors. If yeah. they don't fit in registers, they are not. the data is not in registers. No, then the, they're right? stored in stack space or, exactly. in, or on the heap, wherever it is in the... Exactly, copy. so it's not always in registers. Therefore, if you reinterpret cast, you can basically use the same space uh, on stack. You can, well, you can't reinterpret cast a span of byte as a vector. You can. The most you can do is reinterpret cast a span of a, a ref of that as maybe a ref of vector, but you can't reinterpret cast a span itself as anything. Yeah, you have to do a load, and the JIT should be responsible for if it's already in register, alighting that. And if it's not in register, then then causing it to load efficiently into register. 
Hmm. Because a, a reinterpret cast takes a T and a U as generic arguments, right? And span can never be a generic argument. So what you would have to do is you would have to pull out the, say, ref my span sub zero so that you have a reference to the byte pointed to by the span. Then you run that through reinterpret cast and you're like, oh, this ref byte is now a ref vector or something like that. But keep in mind it might be unaligned so that you really don't want to do that cast anyway. I, I swear I wrote, I forgot how it works. Every, some code like this. Everything that I see in this class is it, it's doing a read and a copy in the new memory. So You mean in this constructor? In everything in vector, like if the vector that takes just a t value says like, oh, a star, assign star the place I'm going to write equal like, you can't necessarily rely on the source code there. Half of the implementations in the J. Fair enough. Yeah. But as long as if the source code is is uh, representative, then all of the numeric values are copied. The the vector doesn't just inherit the pointer to the memory of, of where it was going. So the vector constructors are all copying into a new structure. If you were to take the pointer of that vector and start overriding its memory, you're not overriding the original value. Yeah, the, the, the general mm -hmm. assumption of vectorized algorithms is that your span or array is a pointer to memory. And when you get your vector, you are doing a load from memory yeah. into a register. Yeah. So that's the general assumption. So, so this constructor would be saying, read this from memory into a local register for immediate consumption. So I, I believe that the, the question that Steve asked is, Correct, and of why did this take span instead of read-only span? The answer is someone forgot eight letters. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it, it's an almost mistake. Right? It treats it as a read-only span. It copies the value out of it again according to the according to the IL. It does this equal unsafe read unaligned as vector of that guy. Jeez, I, and, I swear I was reinterpret casting spans to vectors and vice versa. I just need to, I think it may be when we had reinterpret cast as an instance member on, I mean, maybe. on, on well, span. I, I think you were, you were turning a span of byte into a span of vector of byte, possibly. Yes, still, as you, as you observed, it means that it cannot be just the reinterpret cast method that now we now have, yeah. because those are generic parameters which won't uh, accept span as arguments. But I think we used to have an instance method on span to do that. Yes. And then it worked, and it was just reinterpret cast, and it was not copying. And then maybe we just moved this API here, and we kind of didn't change the signature. Well, let's see where that was out of them. Levi, you remember, correct? Like we I, I were, wasn't, I we wasn't were working together on this, this code at some point. Well, I, I, I was involved with the reinterpret cast stuff, but I wasn't involved with this, so I don't know the history yeah. of the specific constructor. I think this is possibility that we basically had it such that it was not copying, then we moved it to this constructor, and then yes, it requires copy now. And then somebody forgot to change it from span to read on the span while they change the code to copy. It's possible that uh, because we do a lot of unsafe stuff internally, taking a span was all that was really necessary for our own internal scenarios, being part of course you are with our effects. So we maybe just never ran into it before. I mean, clearly we never ran into it before if I just opened this one. I think it's reasonable. So what, what's the conclusion? Should we add it? I think we need to add it. I mean, now it's kind of too limiting. We make a okay. We need to. Can we obsolete? I'm that almost one? sure that we make a copy. Or you said you checked, correct? So I'm, if we 100 percent make a copy, we should we it, have to add this. In, if it's not hardware accelerated, we make a copy. Yeah. Well, what if it's hardware accelerated? I can't see that. <laughs> <laughs> not in this repo. <laughs> well, I think it just does a load in the register, right? So. Which is effectively the same as copying. So you just do a load of a pointer that the span represents. I think that's all it does. So let's assume for that and that's true. What, what, what do we do? Then we have to add the constructor. No, I mean, like, okay, yeah, but will we, will we obsolete the other one? Will we hide it? No. So I think that will be a good idea. Like, you really don't want the span one, right? Clearly. 
I mean, it doesn't hurt. If you have a span, then you have a span. It just avoids the implicit cast read on the span. Yeah. yeah. What about the other members? It. Somebody proposed some other members. This needs to happen. <laughs> it, uh, the the other members that were proposed were um. It assigns to this, which is the copy and writing it back out into a span. I'll copy this guy. Like one one thing that I actually didn't write in here that I wonder if we need is um, a constructor overload that also just takes read only span of byte, as opposed to read only span of two. Uh, just a specialized one. Yeah. Because you think it's common enough that we want to avoid the type of waterfall. Yeah. That way, it it saves the developer from having to do their own reinterpret cast. Do you want to edit right here? Uh, so it would. Sure. So the uh, the addition would be public vector read only span of byte in addition to read only span of t, and then copy to span of byte try copy to span of byte because vector can only be used for numeric types. So there is no worry about like exposing private fields or anything mm -hmm. like that. I don't know what will happen though when you have vector of byte. But is the span that you pass? Oh, the span that you pass in, this needs to be right size, correct? What it just, mean? it needs to be, I, I would assume, at least as big as size of vector. What, what if it's like, you know, let's say yeah. my vector is of ints and I pass you read only span of seven bytes? If, if the total length of the span is less than 32 bytes, assuming a 256 bit vector, I would assume this would throw. Would what? I, I assume this would throw if you pass it a span that's too short. Oh, what I see. Once, yeah. the, once the span is bloated to bytes. And if it's too long? Uh, I think it would just truncate. I think that's what Vector does Yeah, it just right reads now. the first eight or however long it is. Yeah. So what's the benefit of the byte overload since the JIT will already align the type of? I think this is from Oracle? span of byte to vector of T. Yes. It's spanned by two vector of t's. Okay, basically, so we're not taking, we're not exposing a read-only span of t. We're just exposing a span of byte. No. So the the initial the initial proposal was to work with span of t. I was wondering if we should, in addition, have overloads to take span of byte. I'm having I'm having trouble thinking of a good scenario. It's that. basically span of byte in his uh, like in this ment mental model is it's any mem it's a memory. Yeah. It's. Literally piece of memory. memory. Yeah, so so you're saying expose these in addition to T, that way you don't have to do T dot as byte or yeah. cache byte or whatever yeah. method it is. Yes. Okay. I'm I'm basically trying to avoid people going through memory marshal at all when possible. Especially since okay. we say it's kind of a dangerous class. Yeah. Is as bytes in memory marshal? I think it is. We I don't see where else it could be because we can't do it for any generic span. I thought we made it an extension of it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, but we added the span extensions for the cat. Do we believe that it's, it's not an extension method? It's a static method on memory marshal. There's no this. And we don't want a this as well, because now it would allow you to take yeah. an arbitrary T and just start bit loading it, which we want to disallow in the general case. Yeah. I just thought I'd seen it. But yeah. It, it's, it's public, just not an extension method. Okay. So do we believe the byte overloads are useful there? I the thing is I didn't test what happens if you add these and then you have vector of byte. What happens now when you have read only span of t where t is byte and read only span of byte? Yeah, I added that to the thing. Now I remember the discussion of this. If we bit blit to span of byte, it's dangerous, but to read only span of byte. It seems to be fine, correct? It's not just that. Like you, you now have access to private and internal fields that the developer of the struct might not have intended you for you to have access to. So modulo this the byte thing. We all in agreement that these overloads seem reasonable, correct? Given the API shape. Mm -hmm. So then let's approve this. I added a node that you should look into the byte thing, yeah. and then you can decide what to do with that one as a separate item. So the only thing. So we added the span overload, and we say it's a mistake. Do we continue adding span of 
Oh, it's copied. Those are yeah. writing, so yeah. they have to be writing. Yeah. yeah. Read only. Yeah, I thought, it, I, read I thought only. he keeps going with the let's yeah. now have two overloads, no, one no, no, taking no, no. span, one taking that. But no, no, those can't have read only equivalents. Yeah, the table is longer than the table in the other one. <laughs> Why? Mm -hmm. Oh, because you're. He's further away from the screen. Here, I yeah. don't like. uh, next meeting. But we said at this end of the table. Yeah. <laughs> Crystal, I can make you. Relatively years of convention. Closer to <laughs> the, at this end of the. What is it? Just I can works. make you relatively closer. How? By zooming in. <laughs> is that closer? Cool. Well, the, the wall got closer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And it looks like it calls the explicit span of byte overload. That, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. So next one, Nick Craver proposed that we had IP endpoint parse and try parse. I think we looked into this, didn't we? Didn't we decide that the radio is low? No, we decided it seems reasonable. Did we? We seem to have never discussed it. That's what Steve said. No, Steve said it seems reasonable, and I agree with him. <laughs> Two hours ago. <laughs> Maybe I was just talking to Carol about that offline. I mean, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Is there a well, uh, a well specified pattern for what this will look like? What do you mean? So IP address, like it's. You know, a dot b dot c dot d or the IPv6 format. What's the format for IP endpoint? Okay. Oh, we don't have any parts of it. He's actually proposing the parse ones as well. I see. I thought he was I, just adding the overloads for span. I mean, I assume that parse is just anti two string, and presumably the part the two string for IPv6 has to put it in square brackets the same way the URI does, because otherwise the port separator is ambiguous. Yeah. I mean, pricing IP addresses seems sensible. Yes, if it's in the two string says if it's IPv6, it puts the uh, the address in square braces. Okay. And then column port at the very end. Yep. So yeah, what I mean, this is okay. make a parse which can read two string. Okay. And if it turns out that there's 38 different RFCs that we also need to support later, well, then those become other things. And then we had so the one. Then we the, had then we had parse exact, yeah. and then we. Had, <laughs> well, so one of the implications is maybe then we need to add, you know, some parse methods. You can specify like the formats that you are mm -hmm. willing to accept. But usually those are this are similar, or similarly, there's an overload to two string of what format should it print in. This only has one format that it prints in. Sure, but if we added these other oh, RFCs, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we would probably add it added both yes. ways. At that point, we would yeah. we would say this is what two string does, this is what parse does, and then here are the overloads for where it turns out everybody and their little brother has an opinion on how you should format one of these things. Yeah. Yeah, and the only negative is the ones that take out parameters. If we added additional parameter, it would be a bit strange, but. Yeah, but just, it's fine. It just nudges them. You get parse and try parse, which is the default format, and you get parse or the .NET format, and then you get parse and try parse of like yeah. passing in the formatting of of like you know RFC. I'm totally making up a number, so I'm not going to say one because we're probably going to say. So do we have <laughs> do we have parse methods that take span on IP address? Yes. Because another thing that maybe would be worth looking is. Why just IP endpoint? Like, do we have it? IP address has parse of read-only yeah. span of char. Oh, yeah. we already have those. I, I think Steve said yes as well. He's very faint. Yeah. So yes, IP address has it, but the address colon port mm -hmm. does not. And I don't know what IP endpoint does if you give it a DNS name, but that's not my problem. Right. Presumably, it says it's not IPv6. <laughs> In which case it doesn't put it in square braces. And that's fine because DNS says you can't have a colon in your name. Right. Yeah. IP endpoints constructor doesn't even do DNS resolution, so whatever. Good that constructors yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it takes IP address. Yeah. Okay. So are we okay? Yeah, there's a separate DNS endpoint class that takes a string. Uh, so do we need to add parse on DNS endpoint? 
There's no issue for that, so no. <laughs> that was a joke. Because uh, if, if, if we have IP endpoint for tracking where it's pre-resolved and DNS endpoint for where it may not be resolved, and we're fixing one, we should probably fix the other. All right. So any objections then to the API? Otherwise, approved as is? I mean, do, do we want to add DNS endpoint to it? DNS endpoint has, I'm, I'm looking at their implementation of two-string. It has a weird format I've never really seen before. So what is DNS endpoint again? It's like IP endpoint, but for a string instead of an IP address. Oh, like, you know, foo.com colon. Yeah. I think I think we should be open to it, but there's no need to combine them. Um, and I'm with e Levi. The two string is a little funky. Okay. It's got this weird address family slash thing. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then, then we we considered and said that's a networking issue. Are these the only two derivatives from endpoint? Uh, there is a third that we added in support of um, Unix. What is it? Um, domain socket. Domain socket. Yeah. Because if it is, then maybe we should make it a virtual on endpoint. No. Uh, well, these are static methods, right? Oh, sorry. Never mind. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you invent static virtual and uh, figure out how not to break people, good luck with that. Uh, so, Steve, does Unix domain socket need a parse right now, or does it also need thinking? I don't think so. It's just a file path. I think I think we can, should be okay with just doing IP endpoint right now. Okay. But it's, you know it's worth having talked about it, and we'll be ready if anyone opens this in the future. Yep. Sweet. Right. So, as is. All right. Make internal directory separator help us public. Sorry, which, which one are you on, Lima? I'm oh, sorry, which one are you on, Lima? Uh, 31570. Make internal directory separator help us public. So this okay. is uh, the Enzyme and Trim uh, APIs that we use a lot. And yeah. As MS Build has been going through their code, oh, yeah. they realize they need to use it all the time, too. A rule for uh, Trim that if we take span, we also need to take memory? Um, the that was brought up. The question I had down in there was like, we don't have any of the other APIs taking memory that modify the paths, and it seems weird to add one, and it would be something we should do like holistically. So I guess if it if it trims off the end. And you have a memory, you pass it in. If the length come back, comes back less, then you slice yourself from zero to that length. Yeah. If it's trimming something off the beginning, you know how to do it. It's only when you're when you're trimming off both ends, you don't know what it did. So I and guess the workaround we tell people right now is I guess it's fine. like just trim one, then trim the other. That way you can do all the math for yourself yourself. Yeah. But it's but I, I feel that there was something that we did where we said to start adding memory overloads because because people couldn't tell what modifications we had done. Well, there is a, uh, there was a, an accepted proposal for like read-only memory of chart off trim as an extension method. So presumably, 
you could use that. You could just call that directly, assuming you know what the path separator character is, and then you don't need any of these helper methods. Yeah, that's 30592. Yeah. I think Jeremy actually linked it a few lines down. Okay. But it's a bit concerning that like we would be taking, you know, like read only span of char and read only memory of char and string of blah blah blah. They all they all kind of have this read only span of char as a tough type. Yet we keep adding overloads for Well it's like it's it's, it's just a question of when we're if we're trimming off of both ends. Uh, so like we have the trim white space thing which moves removes white space off both ends of the string. If you had a memory and we give you back a span, because that's the Yeah, I understand uh, that. You don't know yeah. where that yeah. span was. And I'm just yeah. I understood that. We yeah. just discussed it. I'm just saying it's kind of unfortunate that we would we are in the world where we have to add three overloads. But uh, since this has an implicit direction, you don't need it. The user can just do it themselves. If they had the memory, they they'll have to understand how to slice it themselves. Yeah. But they need to find the indices where they want to slice. But you would say my memory thing equal my memory thing dot slice zero to call this method dot length. But again, like the, the trim method exists already now as of very recently, right? But so it's there are two characters. Two characters that you might need to trim? Yeah, there's the alternate directory separator in the current in the Well let me just double check it. Yeah. yeah. We, we we check both. And trim doesn't take two characters as a parameter. Um, I don't know about that. I just wanted to call that particular one out. Yeah, sure. Because sure. I I'm wondering if this is just so it's it's, aw it's awkward to build it up to like yeah we, we do have be allocating in that case right. An extension method on read-only span of char that can trim based on a read-only span of char, which is a collection of characters to trim. But, so, which which would be fine. That then we now. then we'd be adding a wanting to add an API to path that gives you back a the uh, well, the array. Then, and it's weird actually too. There, there, another weird thing in. with this is that like it's yeah. suboptimal because on Unix there is only one. Yeah. I mean, is this so, really an MS build specific scenario? No. This is pretty common with just doing. I guess the problem is, in order to do it with the least allocations, we would hold the static array and use that array, but we can't give you the array because then you could write to it. Well, we could give you okay. the array as a read only span. But now, now you're, you're now you've got messages. span, and now your async methods get angry at you because spans leaked across flow, and yeah. So having the method encapsulate, I'm talking about this array, and you never get right access to it. It's... And there's in these cases too. There's like no array again in Unix. Uh, I mean, we could build the array and have it have just one member on Unix. Sure, sure, but like the the code is just a little bit more optimized in that case, right? Yeah. So I don't know. So uh, would it be acceptable if this API just gave you an int, how much you need to trim? Basically it takes, we only have overloads that take span. One returns you a bool, the other one returns you an int. Whatever you, you call the API, you get an int, and then depending on what your data is stored in, you slice it using this int. Uh, why would we? keep the bool one, then we would just say the int one returns a negative number if it doesn't end in the thing. Or it returns the length. No, 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 no. The bool I meant ends in directory separator. It already returns a bool. I don't understand why we have two overloads here, because it doesn't... Um, the two overloads? We have two That's overloads was... because of uh, F-sharp. Yeah, yeah. We're not allowed to depend on implicit cast to read only span from string. 
We, we actually started with the other path APIs with no strings. Oh, you were on sabbatical at that time. Yeah, no, we no, have to no, no. I was on the email. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> um, okay, fine. fine, fine. Uh, yes. So, yes, we, we make the string. It the, it calls internally the read only span one, and then it just it makes it easier for uh, F sharp and VB and COBOL. Okay, so just for the first two methods, we could return an int, and it kind of solves all the problems, except it's not as convenient. Yeah. But if we did the tricky work and return an int, then people can write the extension methods themselves that take the negative number and return, it, and turn that into false. Or, you know, they just write it less than No, no. Why, why, what would negative number mean? When do we return it? So if it didn't end in a separator, we would either return input.link or we would return negative one. Yeah, we, we, should return, from the... we should return an int that they can just plug in into slice and it gives them what they expect, right. which is zero. not negative numbers. But I feel that the only reason anyone would ask ends is if ends in, then call trim. And it's like, you know, you did this wrong. This is like asking contains key followed by yeah. dipping into the dictionary. Like, how about we, we make it easier for you and you just have the get this answer, and if you wanted the Boolean state, you can make your own less than. You can always do it. If we return the length, then you just check if it's the length I don't need to trim. Yes, if we return the trimmed length, yeah. then if it's equal to the input, then it didn't Exactly, end then you it. don't need to do it. So this but is, you can do it, it's gonna just give you the same thing. So, so it's this, like is, a, this is one method, sorry, two methods, because we need the string and the, and the read-only span of chart. Yeah. I don't know if it's worth it. Yeah. I think it's a reasonable amount of efficiency versus, like, it, it expresses the intent, it, uh, it solves the span versus memory problem, and I don't, I, I can't imagine a case where somebody's using the Boolean to not then just call the trim. What is the, what is the span versus memory problem? I'm not, still not following that. If, if, if I have a read-only memory of char, and I call the trim, it will get implicitly cast down to read-only span of char and give me a span, but that's useless to me because I need the memory. So now I have to go back and call slice myself based on the length of the span that was returned. So what I wanted was the length. Sure. Therefore, why don't we just return you the length? Right. Because if you have a span, you can call slice. If you have a memory, you can call slice. And you didn't waste the time copying the extra register. Look, I made a perf argument for it. Sure, but then <laughs> it's I, twice as fast. It's, I, it's I don't understand why the why the boolean then is not enough for you. What boolean? It's a boolean. It's an yeah, in directory separator. Yeah, because you might have multiple separators, so you're going to have to call it in a loop until it returns. Oh, uh, we, we don't. We don't. We only trim the one. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Never mind then. Because you're they're they're sort of meaningless unless you've normalized. Yeah. The, the current implementation says if ends in directory separator and is not a root path, then return path dot slice zero to path dot length minus one. Yeah. Sorry. I'm. Like paging this all uh, back in because like that's why the boolean is not enough because you need that extra question of does this say d colon backslash in which case you don't remove it <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. what the the trim and tell me what the length is after the trim and instead of the does it end in this because then we need to change the definition of does it end in this to say it could but sometimes that's important <laughs> so basically <laughs> but then so, I would argue that then these APIs are not I mean so ignore the spam ones for a second let's only talk about the spring one right so we have trim ending directory separator and we have ends in directory separator so when I have c colon backslash one returns false Oh, sorry, one returns no. true, but the other one still doesn't trim it. So, like, they are not really correct. So, like, like behaving in a consistent call, way. Call it. It's just that's a very common bug, too. By the way, right? So, so, like, when you when you when you trim it, like, if you trim c colon backslash, like, you turn it into a file, right? So, so I think that the primitive in this operation is trim, and so we should only have the trim one. And the, someone can now write the Boolean correctly in terms of that, unless what they really wanted to know is does it end in a backslash or forward slash? Well, they do, because uh, there's, there's another, the other case to this thing is that you actually have to add them. Because, like, in the, if you're compare, I actually just tweeted on this <laughs> yesterday. Like, if, if you don't have uh, a, a directory separator on both, you, you can't compare them successfully. Agree, like, but notably, then, like, but then I would argue this, the, this was that issue with zipping and stuff. But then I would argue the primitive for that. So basically there's two primitives then. One of them is remove it if it's there, and the other one is add it if it's not there. So you would never need well, the bool then. Well, remove it 
It's remove it if it's safe to remove it. Right, and edit if it's... Actually, required. I'm thinking that the uh, primitive is index of ending directory separator. Once you have that, all the other ones you can implement them by comparing lengths or calling slides. So, Except well, you, and, and you'd have to call is you know is path what get the path, the root length and so on right. and so forth. So I, I think because like the, the, this also happens in like we we put this bug in multiple times. I, I think that the, the thing that would be that. needed here, given that we've seen a lot of bugs with path, is find the one method in terms of whatever you want, and we can solve the overloads later. Find the one method that will not result in someone writing a bug. And yeah. if we can't write it in one method, then maybe we shouldn't do it. Yeah, because yeah. I think people who are joining paths will just use path.combine or path.join. And so this one is really for, I want to logically compare two paths to see if they're equal. The the ends in one, yes. Yeah. But the trim one is... Well, if you trim both and you, and you compare them and they're equal, then it's the same as saying if, if either ends in, then trim to make them equal. Mm -hmm. Well, well, well you the, it's, it's it the trim it starts right. with is the other one, yeah. right? So you can't trim. So it's a typical thing where you need to know whether there's an ending. Because start, starts, like if you're going to say starts with, like to see if something's nested, you have to have an ending separator. Hmm. Or right. write some pretty complicated logic. Right. Well, or if you have to format it, right? If you have to, if you have to construct a command argument, for example, you need to sound it with quotes. Well, then, if it ends in a, in a directory separator, I have to put a space in between, otherwise I get bogus behavior on the command line. Well, and then there's Unix, where it's completely valid to have multiple directory separators and their equivalent paths. Right. The thing is also true on Windows, right? You can have as many as you want. It yeah, yeah, but like, yeah, for, for the purposes of path, the, it's always to, uh, you're, you're supposed to, the pattern you're supposed to be following is to always normalize it. So you call get full path, and that always takes away the extra separators. So, but like, okay, them. let's try to resolve this. So, like, I would agree with Jeremy that can we can we find the, the the API we want, and then we can talk about which flavors we want them in, like span versus memory. But I'm not. Well, like, I think even if we ignore the string, like if we just focus on the string one, do we think that the current overloads are the white ones? I believe so, just because of the complexity of the trim. This is what we're currently using internally. But these yeah. APIs don't solve the internal memory spot. problem. Yeah. The, the what? The, 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 the issue that Jeremy was talking about, if your source is memory of char, this, this API so doesn't help you. You have to do more work. Yeah. You have to do more work. And we, we, we can add the memory of char, and it was actually asked. I just, like, it's... There are other APIs in path that manipulate strings that take read-only span and probably should take memory. That was my yeah. that was my uh, my feedback on that. I'm fine with adding it. It just seemed weird to add one and then sort of dangle the other ones off. Like I just think that the the notion I sort of, of wanted to deal with that as a separate issue. Ins and directory like, separate. Add, add appropriate memory of car to path. It overloads, right? Yeah. And just do the whole thing holistically. It just feels like that no one knows what ends in directory separator means. I think it means ends in path dot directory separator character, which is the property we expose that exposes the array of all directory separators. Yes, but I think that people well, would then also think that it very validly means if I remove this, am I talking about the same path? And that's not true on Unix if your path is front slash. And it's not true on Windows if it's simple and backslash. Uh, and so there's the question of like, does the is rooted need, like, there are weird states once you're talking about those degenerate paths. And, and, um, and if on Windows you just wrote backslash, backslash, question mark, backslash, like, I don't even know what that means. And, um, well, it means nothing. <laughs> so, sorry, maybe I missed it. If I uh, pass uh, c columns backslash, ends in directory separator returns true or not? Returns true. true yeah. Oh, returns true. I thought we basically said we will make it smart. No, trim is smart. No, this, the trim is the one that has to be smart. Yeah. says, okay. yes, this ends in a directory separator, and you go, 
great, so trim it, and it goes, okay, no off. Yeah, so this <laughs> is another issue. I also think that people will think that these two uh, methods, they have something in common. And, yeah. Right, that's where I think uh, that this is setting up, they, they have two different meanings, but they use the same word to describe them, and I think that that's a bit of failure. And, well, I'm I, I, I'm happy for suggestions on naming. It's just right. sort of awkward. I'm just trying to understand who calls the Boolean one and who calls the trim one, and can we get them on a common primitive that has a universal meaning? Right now in source.net, it looks like ends and directory separators only called by trim. Right. Well, no, there's also. it's shared code, so it's all over the place. Okay. Yeah, cause that, cause, oh yeah. So I see. right, because if if trim is the user space primitive of I called trim and it didn't change, so I need to add a separator, or I called trim and it did change, so it was normalized. And man, oh. I want the old string. So uh, <laughs> internally, we've got both trim and ensure. Yeah. And ensure is the one that you say if I wanted to have an ending separator, I call that. Right. And if you want it without, then you call trip. Yeah, and sure, maybe that's the right thing to expose. Ensure sure is just annoying with the span because now you need to give it a destination to write to, and if it was fine, then you didn't need to write to it. And it, like, yeah, trim is easy. So you can constrain over the exact same memory. I yeah, you know, we can say trim non rooting non rooted. Trim ending directory or uh, trim ending separator pass root or something like that. So, what if we uh, just I, remove I, the ends? I understand that they are still shared shared within our code, but can we just not expose the ends in? Like they seem to be basically very tricky to use properly. It's not enough. The ends like, and directory separator. Yeah. Something so we basically just have to <laughs> and we add one more overload taking memory of char and and we go for it. Um, Why do we well, need I mean, public ends in directory separator? What? Why do we need ends in directory separator to be public? Good. Uh, the same reason we use it internally all over the place is to know that, like, when we're comparing paths. It's, uh, what I'm like, saying we is, actually, it's, I just, I just made a change to to zip to actually call this and then add it, if you think and then do starts with. And you want to ask, is this directory that directory? You want to normalize the directory, which is make sure that there's a slash on the end of both of them. Yeah, well... So, if you want... Well, to so, like, if, if, if you're know. comparing two plows, you trim it, right? If you're, like, for equality, if you're yeah. if you're checking for starts with, you have to yeah. actually add. Uh, so, what I was... If we think there are scenarios like comparing, we should just have our paths equivalent... Yeah, that's, that's, and then that, basically, that, that's, because that's a nightmare. You see, like, I think I've that as we were talking about years. this... Uh, like having APIs in the middle, they are neither performant nor conveni uh, convenient. The same thing I think is similar here. It's like, I think we should either have high level APIs that correspond to scenarios or very low level primitives that you can compose. The, the, and this the, the one seems to be like in the middle. It well, has some smarts, but not too much. And If you, the, if you there, have, oh, go ahead, Jeremy. There, there's a really, I, I've been thinking about this like ever since I, started on the team three years ago about how to write uh, a compares for paths. And it's really, really tough to do because there's, a, when you're talking about equivalency, you know, what does it mean like when you get something that's like C colon backslash and then you get one that's back, you know, backslash, backslash, question mark, backslash, C colon, backslash, and then you get another one that's like uh, represents the device syntax. It doesn't even put the C colon in it, but it actually points to the same location. Yeah. It, it goes on and on and on. Uh, it's really, really hard yeah. to like represent that in an API that people would not fall over themselves but pretty it's, hard. But it's very hard there for people who try to use this ends in will run into many of the same problems. So it's kind of like we are just passing the bug, correct? Like, well, the 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 most likely API that I would probably it's just like you have to put such really verb, extreme verbiage on it, right? Is it like saying like the, because uh, again, you say like is nested, right? You know, it's like, well, that's only from a string perspective, right? You know, you can still represent that same nested path in a different way. I mean, right? the, one of them is a path problem, which is the 
string of letters that you type, and another one is a file system problem. So the device syntax and C colon backslash, they are file system the same, but they are not path the same. Correct. Mind, because they're different strings. So the path class would be about string manipulation, not about logical go resolve sim links, go find, am I going to touch the same block on disk? That's that's the file yeah, system. Yeah, but like the, uh, people walk down that path pretty quickly. Indeed, yeah. but I think if it, so, if we make things that are very clear about the level of smarts they're doing for you, then we can answer a certain set of questions, and they're probably the questions people are trying to answer, and they're writing their own bugs, because even if we expose these, <laughs> like, one of them's a stick of dynamite, and the other one's a lit match, and they can't put them together in the same way. But, but how, do you think that this ends in directory separator is a, a string operation or a file system operation? The ends in? That's a string. Well, I guess. But you see, it implies that it's a file system operation because directory is a file system concept, not a string concept. So I agree with you. If we had a method, remove from strings... Uh, or, you know, does the string end in... Well, yeah, that's where it comes back to. It, does it, should, it, should such a public method return true or false for C colon backslash? Yeah, I, it's and... the question of, like, do you want to compare normalized strings, in which case you keep the same, like, path root and everything, and but you give it a consistent syntax, or do you want to both, or do you want to also resolve that to a consistent location? Is the way I would, like, view that difference. And then there's the whole Windows versus POSIX Windows versus Unix problem on capitalization. So, uh, versus yeah, Unix yeah. writing to a fat system. Uh, yeah. So the, the, semant the semantics that people want, or, or is it, it's hard. It's hard to represent. I'm trying to be very, very careful about how I uh, expose additional APIs here, because you know the is rooted one people get wrong all the time. Combined, obviously. People get wrong as well. That's why we had a join. But um, so, in, in, in any case, like certainly the, the trim one is like super important to like provide. Now the naming, I'm totally open to coming up with something very explicit because that's a super common bug, right? Is trimming yeah, trimming yeah. the root of the I mean, directory the, the separator. trimming methods to me, the only issue is with this memory of char. But I don't actually have a problem with the first two methods because they are super useful, and um, and they are the high level. They are they are the extreme. They are the high level. They do what the caller wants to do. Yeah. The two other ones, yeah. they seem to be like trying to be primitive, but they ha they kind of mix a bit of I'm a primitive that doesn't know anything about file system. Oh. I'm a primitive that doesn't know anything about the file system. The ends in. Right, well, yeah, but they are not there. The, the fact that it, the fact that it has the, yeah, the, that you then, that you as the caller need to also understand a rooted path past that point. Yeah. The ends in, oh, if you're going to trim. Well, if you're going to do anything. something, you might need to understand rooted paths. No, I mean, only if you trim. It's typically that one is like, went again, to add. Right. So maybe the right answer there is just put in sure. And if we had not sure, maybe not, we not could do, just document. Not do ends. If, if we had not sure, maybe we could just document that. Um, if there is not, if it so, it, like if it already ends in the directory separator and therefore it's a no-op, then the span we return is the span that was input rather than a copy of it. That way, it's still efficient. I mean, we you don't return a span; you write to the span. Well, so we wouldn't. Well, it, either we take the span well, you, and we mutate it, or we take an input span and an output span, and we have to copy it. So. Anyway, uh, I, I can see, I can see I can see that I can see the argument of like not doing ends in and putting in sures because that like. Yeah, I just want to make sure that the APIs great. don't have a this is the right API to call unless. Uh, and yeah, so I guess it's and ends in sure. like, there, there, it's not there's nothing wrong with calling ends in directory separator. It's just 
what you would do Unless with it Unless you're writing your own version of trim and it's a rooted path. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But that's why that's why we have the other one. It's just sort of weird to skip it. But like I, I, I can see that people would miss the fact that there is already a trim and then calling in themselves and yeah. building their own. So fine. I'm I'm so do we want to change this to trim and insurers? Insure? But then ensure has this problem of the it, mut it mutates it, correct? Yeah. It needs to take so like, two buffers in. Yeah, yeah. We would or need to have it to, takes one span in. That, uh, oh, we need. You couldn't do that because we need to know that we. Can so we would have to. Have, we would have to have the try and shorter. Yeah. So so in in short for span would need to copy. Yeah. Unless we expose the end, that way people can check. And it's, it's, so I, I still, I, I, do we have more scenarios than just trim where somebody would want to call this engine? And uh, yeah. you mentioned yeah, compare, it's, it's, but compare it's, is so complicated that I like don't believe that anybody will write it correctly. So I still don't understand what the scenarios. No one is. should well, do their own concat. They should use join. Yes, so it's the compare one is really what that's for. But we just said that even you cannot implement a compare com uh, correctly, but we expose the method. Well, I, I, can, I can implement it correctly. It's just that people take it to mean something that it doesn't mean, right? So that's that's the tricky thing, and like coming up with the right verbiage for that so that they don't like – so it, it, it's like the, uh, the old security stuff that we had, right, for PaaS on desktop. So right. okay, when you so try, when you try to, when you try to restrict somebody to a particular location, that's so you, easy let's say somebody to tries to implement compare, is ends in directory separator the biggest problem that they have? Like that's well, the, no, the, biggest, the biggest problem. The biggest they have problem to implement is... 500 lines of code that is super complicated, and this one is just like, hey, open code. The the biggest problem is that they're like the is, is the well. That's that's the easiest mistake to make is just not to add like just assume that something is underneath, but it, it's too. It's it's sort of the, the 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 negative logic on that right. So like if you are going back to the, the the security restriction right, it's easy to block access to a given string, right? To say like or to allow access rather. So like we can say like, you can access this string of a path, right? But if we wanna block that thing, there's so many other ways to get into it, right? That like, it was impossible to really implement correctly. So this, the, the same issue comes in here when you're like when I'm trying to provide a compare path is making it clear that like, what that means is that that thing is definitely underneath or the answer that comes back outside of that is not false, it's maybe, right? Okay, it should be... So, so sort of like the file exists problem that I also tweeted like... like it seems ago. to me we're, we're kind of like in the weeds of discussing and designing the API. Do we think there's... because we only have five minutes left, and I'd either rather... Sorry. Like, so do we, do, we want, do we want to come back with a... I mean, we can... What I would do, do is I would approve the first two methods. I think there's no controversy, correct? We all agree. It's... It's useful. Do, do you want do you want the the span trim to return the int of the length, or do you want it the span or the char or sorry the span and the memory overloads, just, or just do the span overload and let memory yeah. people understand that they have to do extra work? I, I'm I see the negatives of memory. I would just add memory because it's high level API for the average developer who just wants to freaking trim it and get and move on. Yeah. The int one yep. is kind of not convenient okay. enough that I would just add it. Yes, we have three overloads, but at least the method is very useful and it's simple to use and it okay. does exactly what you want. That the, the latter two, I'm not, I don't feel super strongly. If people in the room think that we should add them, I don't object, but I would, well, I, I, I would discuss it more because I think it would be useful to understand deeply what are all the scenarios and what you really would have to do to implement the scenarios co correctly. Because we, so I, I think we should come back with the, with the comparison with in, with insurers for the yeah. second part of it. Well, yeah. and it looks like this proposal is from the MS Build team, so we can just go get Mihai to comment back on how they're using it and how it will help them. Yeah, I, 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 the Boolean one concerns me of if you 
it's a you really need to know what you're doing API on a on a type that is notorious for people really not knowing what they're doing. Yep. So I mean, yeah, I, I'm totally <laughs> fine with coming back with that one separately with a discussion on ensure, right? Because I, I presumably that's really what we want is we want an ensure API. Right. Because so you're either going to you're either going to trim or you're going to add, right? Is that like, then an accurate? Yeah. Right. Read only memory. All right. Yep. Let's yep. Do this, and then I think we're done for today. Yep. This is no way you can remove uh, review more APIs. All right. So then this is this one. Then I say thanks to the people online, and then let me try to figure out how I disconnect the stream now.